Movies like Gone with the Wind and Lost Cause Literature give a surreal image of slavery in America. People visit the old plantations in states like Louisiana and Mississippi, where enormous wealth was made from the labor of enslaved folks. To many, the old plantations of America evoke images of grandeur and prosperity, but those scenes are facades that hide the truth. The shadows cast by those grand houses tell a far darker story. The transatlantic slave trade brought tens of thousands of Africans to the American shores. We sometimes think that all slaves came from Africa, but that is not true. America abolished the slave trade in 1808, but it did not mean that the slave population in the United States decreased. When the African coasts were banned from serving as markets for slavery, America safeguarded its enslaved population by developing a domestic market, by breeding slaves. Whether at the breeding farms or on the plantations and farms, forced reproduction through sexual assault was common. There are many aspects of slavery in America that are too often forgotten or need to be reevaluated. It is assumed that slaves were on plantations for agricultural purposes. They were to till the fields and harvest the crops. That is not true. A plantation was a business that had other profit-making activities. For example, Thomas Jefferson had a nail-making business in Monticello, and George Washington distilled apple and peach brandy at Mount Vernon. These were all separate lines of business that other plantation owners could also engage in. These made extra money for the plantation, but there was also an ominous side to it. The plantation owners could dominate the local economy. If a nail maker voiced opposition to slavery, the plantation owners would be able to run that company out of business using free labor provided by their slaves. The message was clear. Keep your mouth shut. Don't criticize my use of enslaved people. By the way, not all plantations were sprawling estates covering thousands of acres. Plantation sizes varied significantly. While some were large with many enslaved people, others were smaller operations. The size now did not diminish the severity of the exploitation and abuse. The South was not the only home of enslaved people. While slavery was concentrated in the South due to the agricultural economy's reliance on slave labor, it was legal and practiced in various forms in many northern states until the early 19th century. The Lost Cause was an interpretation of history based on fantasies and outright lies. A fable that sprung from the pages of Lost Cause nonsense was the idea that the life of a slave was somewhat bearable. Facts confront that fiction. The Federal Writers Project was part of the Works Progress Administration, or WPA, of the New Deal. From 1936 to 1938, slave narratives were collected from former slaves from interviews conducted with these still-living victims. The stories of these formerly enslaved people were not tales of good times, but of backbreaking work. No one said their lives were wonderful. Some slaveholders were extremely wealthy, but not all of them. It is true there were more millionaires per capita in the Mississippi River Valley by 1860, but only 3% of the southern white population owned more than 50 slaves, and most slave owners had no more than nine slaves. Managing a successful plantation was not easy, and many slaveholders carried significant debt loads. Cotton Gin Slavery was not static before the Civil War. The times and economic changes created alterations in the peculiar institution. An example is cotton gin. The cotton gin's capacity to process large volumes of cotton swiftly was groundbreaking and dramatically shifted the economies of cotton within the United States. Cotton could be processed rapidly, transforming it into a highly profitable crop. This led to the rise of king cotton in the southern economy as vast tracts of the southern United States were converted into cotton plantations. It did not make things easier for the slaves. Rather than reducing reliance on slavery, the cotton gin solidified it. Planters saw the potential for immense profits and sought to expand their labor force to grow more cotton. Consequently, the internal slave trade within the United States expanded, tearing families apart and intensifying the brutality of an institution already marked by inhumanity. Slaves were now expected to work even harder and faster to keep up with the gin's efficiency, as the bottleneck now lay with the rate at which cotton could be picked, rather than separated. This led to even harsher working conditions, longer hours, and more severe punishments to extract maximum labor. There were slave uprisings. Conditions on the plantations were sometimes so harsh that slaves felt they had no choice but to stand up and fight. The best-known American slave revolt is Nat Turner's Rebellion, of 1831. 
Turner, a literate preacher, led an insurrection in Virginia that resulted in the death of several dozen white people. The violent response to Turner's revolt was swift and brutal. Yet it is a testament to the aspiration for freedom. Laws passed to maintain strict control over the enslaved population made things worse. In the antebellum South, a complex web of laws known as the Slave Code was enacted to control the lives of millions of African American slaves. These laws created a framework that not only legalized slavery, but also codified the social inequality and inhumane treatment that slaves endured. Slaves were legally identified as chattel, which meant they were regarded as the personal property of their owners. Under this definition, slaves had no more autonomy or rights than livestock. The purchase, sale, and inheritance of slaves alongside land and other material possessions became typical economic transaction for landowners and people in business. Punishments for violating these social restrictions varied, but they were often brutal and sometimes included mutilation, branding, or even death. Public punishments served as warnings to other slaves and further reinforced a climate of fear and submission. One myth is that slaves were usually submissive. History doesn't support that. Enslaved people in the antebellum South practiced passive resistance. Slaves engaged in the act of quiet rebellion such as work slowdowns, feigning illness, breaking tools, or sabotaging crops, all aimed at disrupting the plantation economy. These small yet significant acts expressed autonomy in a system that denied them freedom. There were other forms of resistance. Slaves kept African traditions alive through music, dance, and spiritual practices, a subtle yet powerful assertion of identity. This cultural retention was an act of psychological resistance, fortifying the soul against the dehumanizing effects of bondage. Such resistance is the root of popular forms of artistic expression, such as gospel music, jazz, and forms of modern dance. One final myth we need to explore deals with the end of slavery. We think that chattel slavery ended with the 13th Amendment. Legally it did, but it did not mean forced labor was over. There were other ways to squeeze a person. The Civil War left the South in ruins and destroyed the economy. People needed a way to feed their families, and the plantations were still there. A system of enforced labor, called sharecropping, came into being. It meant that a person would work on the land owned by somebody else and share part of the harvested crop with the landowner. It rarely worked to the sharecropper's advantage. Many people had to endure Jim Crow laws that were passed to deprive former slaves of voting rights and force them to follow separate but equal laws. Moreover, the legal system used prison gangs to construct roads and do other public projects without the prisoners getting paid. It was a new form of servitude. Breeding Farms The darkest aspect of slavery was arguably its breeding farms. As global sentiment turned against slavery for both economic and humanitarian reasons, the United States, reliant on its 1.5 million slaves for vital exports like tobacco and cotton, couldn't pivot. Despite global condemnation, domestic breeding of slaves became the alternative, fueling the economy and increasing the enslaved population from 1.5 million in 1820 to about 4 million by 1860. Significant breeding centers in Maryland and Richmond, Virginia ensured a steady supply of slaves for the Deep South. We do not have reliable figures on how many future slaves were born in these wretched places. What we do know is that breeding farms indeed existed. Slave couples were forced to have sex in the hopes that the female slave would get pregnant. Sounds dreadful to us, but it made good business sense back then. A slave owner could produce more slaves that way, without paying a high price, and then sell them for a profit. Once plantation owners began treating their slaves as mere breeding stock, men were chosen as bucks, and women relegated to breeders. This role stripped enslaved women of all bodily autonomy, subjecting them to systemic sexual exploitation to increase the slave population. The reality was more than grim. Young women, often in their teens, were selected for their fertility and faced childbirth under brutal conditions. Stories recount young women barely in their 20s, already mothers to multiple children. Their existence was reduced to a cycle of rape, impoverished pregnancy, and childbirth in the fields, with expectations of quick subsequent pregnancies. These breeding women suffered unspeakable violations, a chapter of history often glossed over in our textbooks. This is History on Fleek, and we'll see you next time.